As we return to the final verses of uh, 1 Kings chapter 18, uh, we will be following the main thrust and theme of the sacrifice offered by Elijah to Jehovah that proved and demonstrated beyond shadow of doubt that there was only one God, one contender for their worship, and that is, of course, Jehovah. As we come into the final part of that public demonstration of the authority of God through his spoken word and by the evidence of his mighty presence. We note that before the real need was met in terms of the expectation of the people, having gone through three to three and a half years of drought, the need was for rain. But prior to the rain, there must be the fire. The final verses of the chapter take us to the desired blessing of rain that now falls upon the nation. The overall theme that we set last Lord's Day was simply God eases the pain with a deluge of rain. And um, we didn't quite get to the rain part. So I thought that I'd better have another theme, uh, something similar for today. So today's theme is, in answer to prayer, God moistens the air. So let's have a little prayer before we come to consider this theme this morning. Our loving Father, we thank you that as we gather around your word, we do so with a sense of expectation. For we know that it is your desire to guide us, to instruct us in the way we ought to go. It is your purpose that in and through your word, forever settled in heaven, and engrafted into the lives of your people, that we should, like the psalmist David, so hide your word, protect your word in our heart, that we shall not sin against you. We lack wisdom. We need heavenly understanding as we face the turmoil and the confusion, the rebellion and the stubbornness of heart of a world that has lost its way, we need to know the clearly defining principles of Scripture so fastened to our minds and hearts that we will be able, being clothed with the armor of God, to stand in the evil day, and with assault after assault upon the things of God, we will stand, as it were, ready to fight again. So grant us now as we meditate upon the Scriptures, the confidence of the presence and the power of God ministering to our needy hearts. And may the name of Christ be honored in our worship. In his name and for his sake we pray. Amen. We have um, already noted in our study thus far in this chapter that the significance of the sacrifice that is offered by uh, the prophet Elijah in lieu of the false sacrifice offered by the prophets of Baal on behalf of the god Baal, the indications are quite clearly 
linked to, found, fastened, and secured in the covenant relationship that Israel has had and continues to have with that promise of God. The promise of his presence amongst his people as they walk in obedience to his word and in the execution of his will. The central theme of the Old Testament being the altar with its sacrifice becomes a clearly defined motivation for the worship of the people of Israel. It has built into it the expression of man's need of a savior, man's need of a substitute, one who could represent them in their sinfulness and on their behalf bear the wrath of a just and a holy God. Now we know that according to the words of Paul, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We are left without excuse. Every one of us born into this world are born in sin and shapen in iniquity. As the Apostle Paul in Romans 3 sets out very clearly in his definition of the framework and the personality and the content of the heart of fallen man, he simply expresses it in these words. Within us there is no good thing. There is none righteous, no not one. So we cannot depend upon our own effort, our own good works to produce the evidence of acceptability to a holy God. God cannot look upon sin. And so in between the fires of God's sinlessness and fallen man's sinfulness, there has to be a redeeming, reconciling substitute or savior. One who can represent a holy God and a sinful people. In the Old Testament, the sacrifice on the altar was a foreshadowing of the sacrifice of Christ who is the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. So as Elijah stands before the altar and breathes his prayer to this holy, just God, he requires on behalf of a sinful people, the evidence that God is still willing, still prepared on the grounds of his covenant promises to receive and to remedy the problem of sin. He is the God who responds by fire. And by fire upon the altar and the sacrifice is the evidence that the sacrifice has been acceptable to and therefore is now accepted by God as a substitute on behalf of those who have come to worship. Now, one would imagine that in this instant there is the removal of all uncertainty. There is the demonstration that there can be no other God as a rival to the God of Israel, Jehovah. Going back to the very first commandment established 
in the hearts of the nation as they came out of Egypt's bondage. The first commandment, God said, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Now here they're reminded of that reality. Where is the God Baal now? He has failed to show when they have prayed and caused their supplications to be evidenced by their earnest mourning and groanings and their dancing and their singing and their cutting themselves so that in a measure they try to appease their God by presenting themselves as a sacrifice. But my God has demonstrated there is only the one God, and the people with one accord agree, or at least seem to agree, at this focal point. Look at verse 39, 1 Kings chapter 18. Now when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces, and they said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. So here now, the question put, the challenge that was placed upon them by the prophet, how long do you halt between two opinions? If God is God, serve him. If Baal, then serve him. It appears that now, at least for the moment, that query, that question, that challenge has been resolved. They have all determined that the Lord is God. That has been repeated by their forefathers time after time after time. They've even gone as far as saying, The Lord, He is God. Him only shall we serve. Now here is a drawing on that verbal acknowledgement and religious tradition. And they are saying, The Lord, He is God. The implication of that is, that he is the one that they must serve. But very sadly, as happens so often, there can be an emotional moment where under the vibrations of a spiritual work and the demonstration of the interventions of sovereignty, where God is at work and we can evidence, we can see, we can almost reach out and touch what God is doing, and we know in our mind and heart that He is real. There can be that magical moment where our heart is stirred and we surrender to the flow of emotion. And with others stand and say, I now confess that the Lord is God, and He alone must be worshipped, and I will worship Him. But sadly, just as in this illustration, there are many who, having been moved by the moment, and even caught up in the afterflow and afterglow of what they have just witnessed. There is no depth to their decision. There is no depth to their commitment. And as the seed that has fallen from the Word falls upon their heart, it lies upon the stony ground, or it filters down until it is uh, caught up amongst the weeds that are growing, and it is choked. But it has no root that lasts. Israel, for this point in time, declare, God is the one to be worshipped, and we will serve Him. 
They stand back, and as the prophet Elijah now moves into stage two of the program and requires that all the prophets of Baal be rounded up and brought to him, and there he puts them to death by the brook. They are party to that. They're involved in it. They, they give him support in doing so, for here Elijah stands alone. He would not be able to contend with the false prophets of Baal without the help of the nation that had gathered on the mountain. And so God uses those of Israel to help the prophet Elijah fulfill the will and the purpose of God. And as the prophet continues to demonstrate the authority of God, he now turns his attention, and therefore the attention of the crowd that have gathered on the mountaintop is now focused away from the fire, and now their need is for rain. And just as the prophet prayed for the fire, up in verse 37, he is about to pray for the rain. And you'll read of that as we come down through uh, from verse 41 to the end of the chapter, verse 46. So Elijah prays for rain, and with that there is a little question that springs to mind. If God had accepted the fire and the offering as an indication not only of the demonstration of his sovereign authority, but also of his acceptance of the sacrifice on behalf of the nation. Why did God not immediately send the rain. If rain was what they required, after drought, they needed the rain. The fire was, in a sense, to the unseen eye, to the undisciplined mind, to the unconformed spirit. The fire was not essential to the process of sending the rain. But we know, and as Scripture testifies, that before God could send the blessing of the rain, there had to be a ground of acceptance. There had to be a meeting place and a meeting point. That meeting point and place was at the altar. Now, as far as you and I are concerned, if we are seeking the blessing of God upon our lives, there has to come first a meeting place. That meeting place is Calvary. It is at the cross where Jesus became our substitute. He took upon himself the wrath of God, and he died in our place, bearing our sin on his own body upon the tree. We can have no expectation that God will honor and answer the prayer of the sinner. The only prayer that a sinner prays from the depth of a broken heart and a sincere spirit is the prayer for forgiveness and acceptance. He that comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. But there is no guarantee in Scripture that God will answer the prayer of the unrighteous. 
Now, God is God, God is sovereign, and God is able to answer, and often he does answer the prayers of those who are not his elect people. But there is no commitment on the part of God anywhere in Scripture that conforms God to answer the prayers of the ungodly. Now, you and I know, looking back over our lives, that there were many times before we came into the saving knowledge of Christ, before we came into living, vibrant grace, many times God answered our prayers. Yet the Bible confirms that there are those who are sent from the presence of God to watch over those who are to be the heirs of salvation. And oh, how often our heart has been touched when we've looked back over our lives and witnessed the intervention of God where He has stepped in where we have not deserved it to preserve us and to keep us until we reach that point where our eyes were opened and our heart responded and we yielded to the embrace of Christ and to the comfort of His Word. But here we have in this passage this theme, this thought, that just as there was to be a process that had to be carried out before the rain would fall. That process did not only involve the acceptance of the offering and the visible, physical demonstration of the fire of God's wrath upon sin and his mercy upon those who respond to him. But there now has to be another process between the fire and the flood that must be carried out publicly before the fire will fall. You see, God has appointed certain channels through which and through whom his blessings flow. God's blessing does not fall automatically. And here in this passage, we are confronted by one of those channels. And it is, of course, the channel of prayer. The sacrifice is consumed. But the prophet Elijah does not presume upon the following after blessing of God. He must come in humble prayer. Now, just for a few moments, I want to uh, take you through how this is illustrated in these final verses. First of all, as we try to understand what the teaching on prayer is, in this passage. Come with me to verse 41. Now, here is the conversation between the prophet Elijah and the wicked, ungodly king Ahab. So, here is a believer in conversation with an unbeliever. Then Elijah said to Ahab, Go up, eat, and drink, for there is the sound of abundance of rain. Eat and drink, that's important. They've just gone through three and a half years of famine, drought. Here, their reserves that they have been holding back and and trying to sustain and, and maintain, Elijah said, the time has come. You can eat your fill. Why? Because there is the sound 
of abundance of rain. Now, that in itself is interesting. He didn't look for the sign. He simply followed the sound. Now, if it's raining, if it's raining somewhere up out of Sydney, do you ever hear the sound of the rain? What's the first thing that catches your attention? You look up and you see the sky, and you notice that it's getting dark out there somewhere. So that could indicate that there's a storm on its way. But Elijah heard the sound of rain. Now, where did he hear the sound of rain? He heard the sound of the rain in the fire. As the fire burned upon the altar, he knew that this was the prelude to the deluge that God was going to send. He had a confidence in his prayer. He knew that rain was definitely coming, first of all, because God had promised. Come with me back to Deuteronomy chapter 11. Deuteronomy chapter 11, and uh, let's begin at verse 13. And it shall be that if you earnestly obey my commandments, which I command you today, to love the Lord your God and serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, then I will give you the rain for your land in its season, the early rain and the latter rain, that you may gather in your grain your new wine and your oil. And I will send grass in your fields for your livestock, that you may eat and be filled. Take heed to yourselves, lest your heart be deceived, and you turn aside to serve other gods and worship them. Lest the Lord's anger be aroused against you, and he shut up the heavens so that there be no rain, and the land yield no produce, and you perish quickly from the good land which the Lord is giving you. He had come before God on behalf of the people. He had placed the offering, the sacrifice on the altar. He had pleaded with God to answer by fire an indication of his acceptance of the sacrifice. God had responded. God had answered. And now the prophet knows that they have stepped over that line from disobedience to obedience, the people had declared their commitment to follow the Lord. God now honors his promise. The rain is on the way. And he goes by the sound, not by the sight. Then look at verse 1 of 1 Kings 18. The very first verse. And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go, present yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the earth. See, God had spoken historically or covenantly. He had spoken his promise. But now he has revealed it personally to the prophet. And the prophet knows that the answer is on the way. Now here is the interesting concept and thought, and we do need to lay hold upon this truth this morning. The fact that Elijah had a promise both delivered historically and personally. 
did not mean that Elijah did not need to pray for the rain. Just because God had promised and he believed it did not excuse him from praying. In fact, it made him more determined to pray. God's promises given to us historically in his word, received personally as the Holy Spirit impacts those promises upon us, ought to encourage us to pray with every confidence. Come with me to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. First John 5, let's read verse 13 to 15. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. You see, that is our confidence. God has promised. We believe his promise. God has given us the assurance in our heart that we are his. Therefore, as we pray, we know that he hears and he answers prayer. Come back over into 1 Peter. 1 Peter Chapter 5. Let's look at verse 6 and 7. I'm just picking this out as an illustration or an example. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. What is this? text in reference to. It is revealing and relating to our need to exercise a total dependence upon God. Why do we often pray? We often pray because we're desperate. We often pray because we know that we need the intervention of God in our lives. Now here is the promise. Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. See, that's the promise. Now as we depend upon the Lord, and we come to him in prayer, in total dependence upon him. We cast our care upon him because we know that he cares for us. That is a confidence in prayer. We know that God will answer. Come over into Matthew's Gospel Chapter 11, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 11, verse 28 and uh, 29. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, 
for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. The thought here, I've mentioned this before, let me just share it once again. The thought here is of the older ox who has plowed the field many, many times, finds himself with a young ox who has not yet been skilled or trained or broken in order to work alongside the older ox. And so the two are put under the yoke together. And as they begin to move down the field to draw the furrow, the young ox begins to struggle against the weight, tries to break away and enjoy its freedom. But as it does, it finds that in straining against the yoke, there is suffering and pain until the young ox realizes that the old ox walking alongside is simply stepping out and walks up and down the field with no sign of pain or suffering or frustration. And now the young ox begins to learn from the older ox and steps out alongside, and as they go, the young ox begins to discover that the yoke is easy and the burden is light. How often you and I will struggle against the will of God. We will find ourselves in turmoil because we have not yet given up our freedom We have not yet handed over our will to the will of God. And until we learn to trust God with our lives and with our future and seek to walk with him every step of the way, it is only then we will discover that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. But how can we come into the presence of God and pray with this kind of confidence? It is only as we are instructed in the Word and receive the promises of God as they have historically been given to us in the revelation of Scripture. And as we read the Scripture and confirm the promises, God takes that promise and plants it in our heart. It becomes real to us, so that now in the place of prayer, we're not simply reminding ourselves of the promise God has given to his people, but we are reminding ourselves of the promise God has given to us individually and personally. And so now the prophet Elijah prays with confidence. Let me just quickly go through one or two more without elaborating upon them. James chapter 5, verses 16 through to chapter 18. Come with me and let's read these uh, few verses. James chapter 5, verse 16, 17, and 18. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Now we could stop there and say, what a wonderful thing. And how good would it be if we could ever attain unto that spiritual stature and maturity? What if we were to be considered like 
the prophet considered to be a righteous man praying righteous prayers. Well, look at verse 17. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. You see, chapter 18 of 1 Kings, we see Elijah standing alone on the top of Mount Carmel, surrounded by many, many people, and frantically pleading and praying prophets of a false god. He is standing there alone, and yet it seems that he is carried with a power, a persuasive authority that cannot be witnessed to in the normal, ordinary human sense. And we stand in awe and we think, what a man of God Elijah is. But we turn the page and when we come into chapter 19, we find him slinking into the dark shadows of a deep cavern. And in the cave, he sits there and he feels so demented with what is about to happen if Jezebel has her way that he cuts that lonely figure and would at that point appear to be devoid of any authority or persona of a man of God. Which Elijah would you prefer to have come to your home to bring you comfort in your time of need? The Elijah of the mountain or the Elijah of the cave? You see, Elijah, we're told here, was a man with a nature like ours. He was subject to the highs and to the lows. So there has to be something beyond the character of the man. There has to be a power in prayer that supersedes any ability of the one who is praying. And here we read a little further. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. So what part is Elijah playing in all of this? Did the rain not come for three years just because he prayed? After the three years, did the rain fall just because he prayed? And the answer is no. The answer is the rain stopped because God stopped the rain and told Elijah what he was about to do. The rain fell because God told Elijah what he was about to do. And as Elijah prayed, he knew the very mind of God. A man with a nature just like ours. Now, the next thing, and I'll close with this thought, although I'm tempted to keep going, but I'll close with this thought. Look at verse 43. We're back now at 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings chapter 18. Coming down through, we read in verse 43. He said to his servant, Go up now, look toward the sea. So he went up and looked and said, There is nothing. 
So here is the picture of Elijah. He's now on his knees. See, when he called on the fire, he was on his feet. But now he is praying for rain. He's on his knees. And his head is in between his knees. So he is as low down on the ground as he can go. He is already committed to the answer. He's told King Ahab, there is a sound of abundance of rain. And now he sends his servant off to look. Once he goes, no rain. Twice, no rain. Three times, no rain. Seven times. But the prophet keeps sending him back because the prophet knows that God must honor his word. And even though the circumstances don't appear to be yielding to the prayer of the prophet, he knows that God is bound to send the rain. That is the persistence of prayer. Come with me to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. Matthew 7. And uh, just uh, by the way, in the passing, although it is important, but time doesn't allow us to go into this uh, thought this morning. But you will notice the key word in verse 5 is the word hypocrite. So this passage is presented to those who fall into that category of hypocrite. Uh, let me just pause here to get the balance. Elijah in James chapter 5 was spoken of as being a righteous man. Yet he was of the same nature of you and I. So here's the balance. Here, Jesus is addressing those whom he calls hypocrites. Now, how often do you and I feel like a hypocrite? Be honest. When we are doing something that we know is the Christian thing to do, but our heart really isn't in it. And if the truth were really known, if the shutters were pulled aside and everyone here in the church could look into our heart and really see what we are and be exposed to them, what do you think the word would be that could be used of us? Could it be hypocrite? But notice what happens. Here is what is said to those who are hypocrites. Come down to verse 7. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks, it will be opened. You see, that's the promise. Now, here is the comparison between the hypocrite and the righteous. Look at verse 9. Or what man is there among you who, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? You see, a, a, a hypocrite would give the stone, but not the righteous. Now, here we go on. Or if he asks for a fish, 
will he give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask him? But does that mean a hypocrite as well as those who are considered to be righteous? You notice that there is no particular classification in that promise. For example, the last part of verse 11. Your Father who is in heaven will give good things to those who ask him. So, in spite of their hypocrisy, God still answers the persistent prayer. The word ask means keep on asking. Seek means keep on seeking. Knocking means to keep on knocking. Now, if we were to pursue this, and I'll just mention this very quickly in the passing, look at verse 12 to 21. Therefore, whoever you want, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. In other words, turn around your hypocrisy. Live honestly. Live righteously. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and uh, broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in thereat. And all down through that passage, you have that transition from the hypocrite to the righteous. How is that process carried out? How is the transformation confirmed? Often you'll find that the hypocrite is turned into the righteous through the process of persistent prayer. So, if we sense a lack, a need in our heart, we commit it to God in prayer and with the persistence of prayer, not once, not twice, three, four, five, six, not even limited to the seven times Elijah sent the servant to check on the rain. But if we persist in prayer, then God will change the hypocritical heart into the heart of the righteous. If um, we were to go over into Mark 11, and we may finish off with this Mark chapter 11, um, we'll read from verse 12 through to 21, and this will bring it all, in a sense, together. Mark 11, verse 12. Now the next day when they had come out from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves, he went to see if perhaps he would find something on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. In response, Jesus said to it, Let no one eat fruit from you ever again. And his disciples heard it. So they came to Jerusalem. Then Jesus went into the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry wares through the temple. Then he taught, saying to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of thieves. In other words, hypocrites. 
And the scribes and the chief priests heard it and sought how they might destroy him, for they feared him, because all the people were astonished at his teaching. When evening had come, he went out of the city. Now in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look! The fig tree which you cursed has withered away. Now, this passage has to be taken parallel with uh, the account of um, Jesus given in Luke 13, verse 7, where um, Jesus, you remember, paid particular attention to a fig tree that was not producing fruit. And God said, cut it down. Why cumbereth it the ground? Uh, the key word in the background of that passage is the word hypocrite. You see it stamped clearly in the heart of the teaching that Jesus is giving. So on the one hand, there is no hope. The fig tree is cursed immediately here in Mark 11, and it dies immediately. Over in Luke chapter 13, it is condemned, but it does not die immediately. Now, if you want to understand how that all works and the intrigue of it all, you have to read the first verses of Romans chapter uh, 11. And if you read there, it will tell you how that applies to the nation of Israel. But here is the point I want to make this morning. Come with me now to verse 22. This is still speaking of the fig tree that is cursed and immediately dies. So Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith. In God. For assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Now, do you believe that promise? Or, or does your mind immediately begin to swim out into deeper waters as you look for evidence that this text cannot possibly apply to ordinary, everyday believers like you and me? You really have to be super, super, super duper spiritual in order to be able to apply this text. Well, let's read a little more. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Now, is this a text that you can take and apply to your own heart and your own need? Or do we look at that and say, well, there are bits of the Bible that are not really for us. So we've got to pick out and we've got to work our way through. No, this promise is for you if you are a child of God. And I cannot say it any clearer. The Bible cannot say it any clearer. This is God's promise for those who pray. Now we come down into verse 25. Whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive. Forgive your trespasses. Where does true faith 
display itself in our lives. And here is the interesting thought. It displays itself in forgiveness. If you come to the altar with your gift and you remember there that there's someone has something against you or you have something against them, what do you do first? You go and you resolve that problem and then you come and you offer your gift. The Philippian jailer called out to Paul, what must I do to be saved? The answer was believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. What follows believing? Forgiveness. The Lord's Prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. Lead us not into temptation. What are we told to do? To forgive those who have trespassed against us. See, if I'm a true child of God, I must forgive. It is the evidence of righteousness. I have been translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear Son. How? Why? On what ground? Because I am forgiven and I am cleansed by the blood of Christ. And as I come to God in prayer, I hold no grudge between myself and another. And I endeavor to live my life not as a hypocrite, but as one who was fully committed to the will of God. And what do I become? Under the law, I still stand condemned because I cannot be perfect. I cannot fulfill the obligations, requirements of the law. But this is the very reason why Christ died. Because I cannot be without sin in this world. But Jesus came. And as the sinless Son of God, He died in my place for me, on my behalf. He exposed Himself to the wrath of a just and holy God. And He took the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. And He took it out of the way having nailed it to his cross. So now the hypocrite, trying to live righteously before our fellow man, has now been made righteous before a holy God. And as this sinner comes to God in prayer, covered by the righteousness of Christ. Those things that we pray in His name, for His glory, He answers, not according to our feeble asking, not according to what we may think we deserve, But he responds on the basis of his promise. He responds in the confirmation of the death of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And he opens heaven and he pours out upon us the cleansing flood because he knows that the offering has already been made The offering has already been accepted. The fire has already fallen. And according to his promise, now comes the blessing. First the fire and then the flood. Just note in closing of this 18th chapter uh, what happens uh, next. It came to pass, verse 44, 
the seventh time. He said, there is a cloud as small as a man's hand rising out of the sea. So he said, go up, say to Ahab, prepare your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. Now it happened in the meantime that the sky became black with clouds and wind and there was a heavy rain. So Ahab rode away and went to Jezreel. Jezreel was 16 miles in the old term, 16 miles from Mount Carmel. And he's on a chariot. And the chariot is being driven by the horses, led away as fast as they can go because the deluge of rain is coming. And very soon the mountain will be saturated and the rivers will be flowing freely and the valley will be filled as God abundantly answers prayer. Sixteen miles he has to go and he's going as fast as he can. But look what happens. Verse 46. Then the hand of the Lord came upon Elijah And he girded up his loins and ran ahead of Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. Jezreel awaits. King Ahab takes off in a flurry. And Elijah beats him there. And he's standing waiting at the gate. How does he travel 16 kilometers faster than the chariot? Simply because the hand of the Lord came upon him. What's the obstacle in your life? Have you been to the altar where the fire of God has fallen? Do you have in your heart an expectation that God answers prayer? Then it doesn't matter how great the distance you must travel, how many obstacles will be in the way, If the hand of God is upon you, He will direct you, He will guide you, and He will fill your heart with abundant blessing. Have you said in your heart, the Lord, He is God, and Him only will I serve? Let's pray. Our loving Father, we thank you for your word and pray that you will encourage our hearts in its understanding so that we will learn how to be strong in faith. And like one of old who said, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Make us those kinds of Christians who under the dynamic of the Spirit of God are no longer seen to be hypocrites, but rather those who are confident in our trust and in our faith, knowing that as you have promised, you will fulfill. Draw us and encourage us in your love, we pray through Christ our Lord. Amen.